Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take the same code that we had before and we're going to introduce a more multi-threaded approach to it. Now, I know multi-threaded code may seem a little intimidating for beginners, but like the Marauder from Doom Eternal, the most challenging aspect can sometimes become the most enjoyable aspect once we understand it and have a bit of experience. So, here's the theory. Like I was saying before, we have a series of stages in our process. First thing we want to do is acquire an image, and then we want to render, and then we want to present that image on the screen. Now, these processes are throwing off work to the GPU. So they can actually execute a lot faster than the GPU can do that work in order to do that. And this is really sort of rehashing previous videos, but why not? In order to do that, we have a semaphore which sits between them. This acquire image will signal this semaphore when it's done. And this render operation will wait on that semaphore to proceed. Okay. And then blocking everything off is a fence. And that fence is reset, is signaled, sorry, it's, it's closed, it's closed when the function begins. So when the, when we start this function, we sort of, we reset the fence, we sort of close it so that if this function executes really quickly and the game does its thing, then in the next iteration, when it comes through, it's waiting until this render is complete. And then that fence is open again and the function can proceed. So this is what we can call in flight. In other words, work is currently being done and this frame cannot be worked on. Now, technically in the present section, we're in flight as well, but because we're using mailbox presentation, if a frame is not actively being presented, we can re-render it, that's okay. So this is all well and good. This is what we did in the previous video. You may notice there's an issue. And the issue is, like I said, if the CPU goes incredibly fast, it will go through these function calls and then do its thing and come back. And it might come back while work is still being done because there's no sort of semaphore here that's, you know what I mean? So the issue is this causes a CPU block because it's waiting, it's physically waiting to do things. So, hence the multi-threaded approach. So here's the multi-threaded approach. Very good drawing. Okay, so we come along and we um, have rendered frame one. So let's say we have frame one, two, etc. We've rendered frame one. So right now we are on frame number two. Now let's say we go really fast and this fence is still blocked. Well, guess what? Fence two might be open and that lets us go through without a CPU block. Now, of course, this process of acquiring, rendering and presenting still needs to be synchronized and we can't rely on whatever previous frames are doing. So every frame is going to need its own set of semaphores. So um, all we need to do here is say, okay, um, a frame will have a bunch of things and it will have yeah, a fence and two semaphores, and these will be used in synchronization. Anyway, enough talking, let's get to the code. Okay, so let's get into it. Just to recap where we were at the moment, we can run this and we will see a triangle. It's running at about, let's give it a bit of time to settle. Yeah, okay, about 2600, 2700, something like that frames per second. Okay, looks good. Let's close that down and introduce multi-threading. Now I know what you're thinking, wait a second, doesn't Python have a 
global frame, uh, global interpreter lock, which means we basically need to be single threaded. Well, remember the program itself is single threaded. It's just that we are taking advantage of the speed difference between the program and the GPU. So if the program goes faster than the GPU, then while the GPU is doing one bit of work, we can submit another bit of work. So the multi-threading is actually happening on the GPU side. Anyway, so like I said, we want to set up our frame so that our frame has individual synchronization structures. So we'll have a fence and the two semaphores. All right, now let's go to our engine. It's actually incredibly simple today's session. It's just basically refactoring what we've already got. So down here in make device, see that we have got our swap chain so we can query the number of frames that we have. There we have it. So the maximum frames in flight is really just defining the amount of work that we can be doing at any given time. And we have a frame number. Okay, make pipeline, we can leave that. Finalize setup, down the bottom of finalize setup, we are creating our synchronization structures. So let's loop through our frames and create one for each frame. There we have it, nice and simple. Now we can go down to our cleanup function and make sure that we're destroying them on a frame by frame basis as well. So come down here, <clears throat> come down here. We've got all of our destruction functions, grab those and put them into this frame loop here. Okay. Now we just need to go back and amend the rendering function. So close that. Okay, so this is where it gets, I guess, a little trickier. And what we need to do, where are we? Okay, so query the processes. Now the in-flight fence that we're grabbing, we're going to get the current frame. So we'll go swap chain frames and then we'll index into that based on the current frame number so this will be an integer having gotten that we can then access the in-flight fence for that frame so again as an example if we're on to frame number two then we're going to wait on this uh, wait on the fence for frame number two and once we're in, we're going to close the fence for frame number two behind us. And this is a little bit hard to see, but um, yeah. Okay. And when we do the rendering, we are going to signal frame number two and say that is done. Okay. Now the semaphores. So again, it's based on our current frame. So, uh, yeah, semaphore, and this is gonna be the image available semaphore for the current frame. And then over here, the image available semaphore for the current frame is being waited on. And we're going to signal the render finish. You can see what I'm doing. I'm just reading the code out. The hard part is just visually reading this because there's a lot of clutter, but anyway, okay. Um, I think that's fine. Wait semaphores here. And then I can't see any semaphore stuff. So I think that's okay. We'll find out. Okay. Now the last thing we need to do is increment the frame number and just keep it in range. So in other words, so it doesn't go over length. Um, so I think that's fine. Let's give that a go and see what is happening. 
run that. Oh, okay, what's going on here? Um, engine has no attribute current frame. Oh yeah, what am I what am I doing? That's not current frame, that's frame number. There we have it. Okay, so let's give it a second to settle down. What I found in other experiments was this effect was not so pronounced. It was a small benefit. Um, so similar to the C++ version, we can see that this has improved the frame rate by a little bit. And also similar to the C++ version, I'll note that 2,700 frames per second is pretty good for any program. So I think, yeah, I'm happy with this. <laughs> All right, so there we have it. Hopefully this has been fun. And um, hopefully this is the most important thing. Hopefully you're starting to get more confident using the multi-threaded stuff and the synchronization structures. That's really important. That's a massive part of Vulkan. So yeah, have a good one, have fun, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.